<clears throat> Hello, everyone from Teresa. Hello, Teresa. Welcome. Teresa, how's the knee bone doing? How's the what? Wasn't it, didn't you have knee surgery? Yes, yes, knee is great. I passed uh, okay. physical therapy. Cool. Last class was Monday. Yay for you, yay for you. A new graduate, but I still have a ways to go, but it's all up to me now. <laughs> Well, but to be where you are is really good news. Thank you. Do we have others that are coming in? We had 24 or so registered through the Eventbrite. Yeah, that's what I thought there were quite a few more. But maybe they are here and I'm just not seeing people. Well, and they may still be coming. Yeah. I've got 12 participants on mine, 13. Hi, Holly. Yeah, some others are coming in. Hello. How are you? Welcome. Thank you. Are you in the area, Holly? Are you in, in Greensboro? I'm in Winston-Salem. Oh, good. I'm one of the sponsors tonight. Good. Welcome, Holly. Thank you, Holly. This is Teresa. And Holly, who are, hey, who are you with? Uh, my company is Age with Grace. Sorry, I'm going to move. <laughs> um, I'm Age with Grace, Great. which is uh, geriatric care management. Yeah. Well, thank you for being here. Well, thank you. Thank you for the sponsorship, I should say. She and Jennifer Harris work together. That's that's what I figured. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, I have about two minutes after seven, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. And I'm sure that uh, several will be joining us shortly. So um, good evening. Um, we'd like to welcome you to the adult children of aging parents, or we recap. Uh, our program tonight um, is an overview of residential care uh, options. My name is Bruce McReynolds, and I'm the chapter coordinator um, of ACAP here in Guilford County. So if, you're, uh, if you've been with us uh, before, uh, we're glad to have you back. Um, if this is your first time, uh, welcome. And so for those that may be new to ACAP here in Guilford County, um, to let you know that uh, ACAP Guilford County is one of several chapters who make up the national um, ACAP community. Our programs um, are from our nationally validated copyrighted curriculum. Uh, we have local experts uh, present each program. And our ACAP chapter here in Guilford County is led by over 21 local industry ex experts who select and validate the materials that, that we present during our monthly uh, programs. Uh, ACAP Guilford County um, programs are presented the third Thursday of each month. So um, they're at 7 p.m. And uh, we'd, of course, welcome you to, uh, to join um, all of our programs coming up each month. Uh, just a, a look ahead at our, our next two months. Uh, we, in January, we'll be presenting driving and aging. And then in February, we'll look at anxiety, depression, and aging. So if you'd like to be notified of upcoming programs, uh, you can email us at acapguilford at gmail.com uh, to get on our mailing list. And um, if you'll check out our chat box, um, I have put our email address website 
in the chat box. So you can um, uh, check that out and, and we'd love to hear from you and get you on our regular mailing list. You can also take advantage of expert-led uh, content uh, through our podcast library. Uh, and that is found at um, acapguilfordcounty.org. So we'd love, there's a lot of great content, content there. So um, all of our programming is um, free. Um, so to um, help fund all of our ACAP programs and activities throughout the year, we have three um, wonderful uh, sponsors that, um, that help us just through our um, annual activities. So we'd like to um, uh, thank Griswold Home Care, Providence Place, and Mount Zion um, Baptist Church here in Greensboro for being our, um, our annual sponsors. But tonight's program is brought to you by two, um, two sponsors that have helped make our program this evening possible. So we'd like to um, thank AARP uh, for being one of those sponsors. Uh, for more than 60 years, AARP has advocated for the needs of Americans as they age. Today, more than one in five Americans are caregivers, um, having provided care to an adult or a child with special needs at some time during the past 12 months. AARP is honored to partner with ACAP of Guilford County and other local organizations to provide education, and support of all unpaid caregivers. So to learn more about AARP initiatives, uh, you can visit aarp.org slash North dash Carolina. And again, I've put that um, website in the chat box for you to reference. So um, thank you to um, all the folks at AARP for helping us make tonight possible. We'd also like to recognize our um, second sponsor for tonight's program, uh, Age with Grace. Um, Age with Grace is a care management group that focuses on supporting and assisting older adults and their caregivers with achieving and setting goals for the next stage of life. Their team performs a holistic assessment in order to discover the current circumstance, ascertain goals of both the adult, um, older adult and their family caregiver and set up a thoughtful plan. Their care manager can set things in motion by introducing community resources and ensure the implementation of services is smooth. They can monitor all the services and recognize changes early by staying involved. This enables um, them to anticipate a change that needs to take place uh, in the plan for the family and to advocate to all the providers in the best interest of the client. Age with Grace has been um, helping families and caregivers and their loved ones in the Piedmont Triad uh, for almost 10 years. Uh, so you can find them at agewithgrace1.com. And I've put the email address and the website in the chat box as well. And we'll, uh, we'll post that later on in the program. So let's jump into, um, uh, just before we get started, I'll just mention that if you have any questions throughout the, um, the program this evening, I'd really encourage you to put those uh, questions in the chat box and we will um, um, address those questions um, at the end of the program. So um, let's just jump into our program tonight, uh, which is an overview of residential care options. So as our parents age, uh, they may face a need or a desire to change their housing arrangements. These changes may be relatively minor, such as modifying a home to make it more physically accessible or safe, or even securing a home-based medical or companion services to allow them to live in their home more safely. But these changes might also be more safe such as needing to move to a new residence that's more accessible or with more substantial medical assistance. Um, no matter how minor or major the changes, um, this no doubt will be a stressful time for everyone involved. So here tonight to provide an overview of residential options available to people as they age, along with available resources to address safety, accessibility, 
and affordability is Dr. Uh, Corinne Allman. So Dr. Corinne Allman is an experienced educator, a researcher, and entrepreneur. She received her doctorate in developmental psychology with a specialty in adulthood and aging from North Carolina State University. Uh, she did her postdoctoral doctoral training at Duke University Center for Aging. Currently, she is president of Choice Care Navigators and the author of the rockingchairsecrets.com blog. So um, we're excited to have Dr. Allman and um, we're gonna turn the time over to her. Okay, let me see if I can share this screen with you guys. Okay, you guys seeing my slides? Yes. Okay, Not, nice to have a confirmation. Okay, um, so thank you guys so much uh, for coming tonight. Uh, so what we're gonna talk about, just what Bruce said, um, an overview of the options that are out there. Uh, and this is a really important discussion to have with our parents, but it is a difficult discussion to have. And I like to always, compare this to uh, the other talk. I, I call it the other talk. Um, people have written about this, how uncomfortable these conversations are with our parents. And it can be compared to having the sex talk with your children in the sense that it's uncomfortable. We really like to put it off as long as possible. And, uh, but if we don't have those conversations, there are real life-changing consequences to not doing it, to not having those conversations at the appropriate time. So when my son, my oldest son was about nine, he came up to the uh, kitchen and said, you know, mom, I, I know that it takes a boy and a girl to make a baby, but I, I really don't understand, like, does, does my part come off? <laughs> What, how does this happen? <laughs> and I'm like, no, no, honey, your, your, your parts don't come off. And I'm like, when you get older and you have to get the parts close together, but you'll understand when you get older. And he thinks about that for a while. And then he comes back and he says, mom, I've got another question. I'm like, okay, where's, where's your father? I really wish he was here right now. And uh, he said that, that tonight when we watch a movie, can, can I have popcorn and candy? I'm like, yep, you can have whatever you want. We're good. Just, okay, bye. And, uh, but so I wasn't ready at, ni at nine with him to have a conversation about that topic. Um, so we kind of procrastinate, we put it off, but I've got to do it, right? Because if I don't, he's going to get in a situation where there are going to be consequences and we're going to have things happen that we didn't really want to have happen. Um, and that is why I need to empower him with the right information. We, I need to know that he knows that there's a plan and here's how things need to be handled, that kind of thing. And the very same thing is true when we think about the later years for our parents. Um, if I'm ever talking to seniors themselves directly, I always try to frame this conversation in terms of empowerment. Um, this is not, we're trying to ship you off to an old folks home. This is not, we're waiting for you to die so we can get our inheritance. This is, you need to tell the people around you, your adult children, the people who love you, you need to tell us what you want to have happen. Where do you want to live? Where do you not want to live? So that as things change, we can make plans that we know are consistent with what you want. If for some reason you can't tell us yourself, it's also good to lay those things out so we can plan financially for what that future holds. So it's not a, you know, we wanna get rid of you cause you're old. It's a, we really wanna make sure that we take care of you and we do exactly what you want as things change in the future. Because if we don't, then a crisis is gonna occur. Something is going to happen where there's an injury or an illness, and then your loved ones are going to have to make decisions in that crisis. And if they don't know what you want or what the plans were, that's going to be really hard for them. 
And you may not get what you want because you never actually told them what that was. So it's an empowerment conversation. It is uncomfortable. We do procrastinate on it, you know, because everybody says, I'm not going to need any help. I'm going to die warm in my bed and never need anything. Um, but the likelihood is we will need some assistance. And so planning for that is the smart way to go. Okay. So this is a graph um, that Bob Kane, um, who is part of the Winston-Salem ACAP chapter has put together in the past. And um, I asked him to use it tonight because I think it's really useful for looking at the senior care world. Um, most of us don't pay much attention to this until we do have someone we love who is involved in one of these areas. And then we're trying to educate ourselves really fast about what all these different things are. And tonight, we're not gonna cover everything that's on this graph, but what we are gonna cover is how do we stay at home as long as possible, because that is what most people indicate that they want. And then if we do have to move, what are these different levels of care kind of here in the middle? And what are the differences? What do they cost? What kinds of services do they provide? And how do we decide whether or not we want those things? Are they appropriate for us? Okay, so let's start with everybody's favorite thing. If you ask any senior or almost any senior what they wanna do, they say, I wanna stay at home. I wanna stay at home as long as, po as long as possible and age in place, which basically means as I change, I want to stay here and I want my surrounding to adapt to me and I, want to, I don't wanna to have to leave it. So that really often means a lot of home modifications for families. A lot of seniors live in homes that uh, were not built to be handicap accessible and may have small hallways and doors and they will have to be modified if a senior truly wants to age in place as long as possible. Um, so what we're really talking about here are universal design uh, techniques. A universal design is um, design that is really built for anybody. It's not designed specifically for seniors. Um, it really means that anyone could live in this house, um, anyone is gonna be able to function in this house and function pretty easily. And universal design is generally good for a home in the sense that it brings up its value. Sometimes people worry that if they make home modifications, it's gonna bring down the value of the house. But given that we have an aging society um, in the United States, having a home that has universal design um, pieces in it and is capable of really suiting anyone makes it more valuable, not less. So some things we can do, and I'm gonna show you some pictures of some of these here in a minute, um, but a no step entry. So having a smooth entrance to the house rather than having any steps that um, lead into the home. Um, thresholds that are flush with the floor. And actually that's my next picture. I'll show you that and then we'll come back here. So this would be a home with a no step entry because you see that the um, sidewalk, we go straight up to the house. There's no stairs whatsoever. So this is a home that is built with that no step entry. And this is a doorway that is flush. The threshold is flush. Um, sometimes in homes right here at where the door seam is, you'll have that little uh, piece of wood or seal for the door. That's what my dad always calls a toe stumper. Uh, because it's the thing that you stump your toe on as you walk through the door and it's a huge fall risk for seniors. So eliminating that from our doorways is a big uh, benefit for anyone because we all stump our toe on it, but really beneficial for seniors. Okay, um, other things, one story living. So having all of the essential pieces of the home in one place. So that means having one, one floor where you can eat, sleep, go to the bathroom that is barrier free. So there's no like the kitchen and then you got to take one step down to get into the living room or anything like that. All one floor, barrier free so that they can do all their living on that floor. Wide hallways, wide doorways. So if we ever have to have a walker or a wheelchair, we're able to roll right through. Extra floor space so that it's less cramped. Um, and anybody who's going to have a wheelchair or a walker will be able to move through that area easily. But again, 
we all like these open floor plans these days. These are very popular. So it's, it's a benefit. Everyone likes that feel to a home. Other things, whoops, sorry, a little too far there. Other home modifications we can do. These are just comfort features. Um, and these are not things, most of these are not things that are super expensive. Um, so floors and bathtubs with non-slip surfaces. So if we're installing new floors, we wanna make sure they're non-slip, putting non-slip things in our tub to make sure we don't fall while in the, on the bathtub. Um, handrails and grab bars in the bathrooms. And we'll look at the bathrooms here in a minute um, specifically. Good lighting. So one of the things that happens as we get older is it takes our eyes longer to adjust when we go from bright lights to dim and vice versa. And so when you walk into the room as an older adult, it takes longer for your eyes to adjust and you to be able to see. So making sure that we have good lighting, we have motion, sometimes those little motion activated lights that click on as you walk through the room that can be put down at floor level, those are excellent, but making sure there's lighting available. Um, the examples here in the pictures, these are, um, this is a rocker light switch that's easier to turn on and off than the ones that have the little part that sticks out further. The um, door handles, having a levered door handle like this, if you have arthritic hands, it becomes very difficult to get a hold of those round doorknobs and get them to turn. And so having a levered handle is much, much easier to grasp and get out. If you've ever had lotion on your hands and you couldn't get a hold of the, the, the rounded uh, doorknob, you know how that frustrating that can be. And then even putting these little um, switcher, switches on the lamps, same thing, those little round turn things on the lamps, they're annoying. And as you get older and you have arthritis in your fingers, they're even more annoying. So putting on these light switches on your lamps can make things a lot easier too. And then of course, um, if you don't have a home that already has a um, no step entrance, you may want to install a ramp. So this is a home that had a few steps going in the front door. And so lots of times you'll see people install these temporary ramps um, so that they can stay at home, use their walker or their wheelchair to get in the home, but not make a permanent change to the house. Um, moving on to some bathroom modifications. So we talked about grab bars around the bathtub uh, so that you can hold on to something as you're stepping in and out. The other piece um, that you might choose to do is put in a fully handicap accessible bathroom. Um, you see these, if it's any sort of senior living community, they're going to have fully handicap accessible bathrooms available. Um, and then having modifications to the toilet. Um, I don't know if any of you watched uh, Grace and Frankie, uh, that show, but they had a whole season where it was about Grace, um, Jane Fonda's character and her creating a, a toilet seat to help her get up. Um, so the, this is a real issue for seniors, being able to go to the restroom, get back up safely um, after they've used the restroom. And so you can make modifications to the toilet um, this one, the picture we have here, I particularly like because it not only raises the seat up, but it also gives you those grab bars to hold on to, to be able to push up when you need to move. All right, so those are all things we can do to the house. Um, you can also get help at home um, to help you stay there longer. So two different kinds of help that are generally available. Home care. So home care is like companionship care. So they do personal care, like maybe helping somebody get dressed or helping with a bath, um, but meal preparation, cleaning, things like that around the home. Generally a caregiver or a certified nursing assistant for um, that type of work. Uh, in our area in Greensboro, between 18 and $25 an hour, depending on how many hours of service you're using, Often if you're using more, more hours, you can get a slightly cheaper rate than if you're using um, fewer hours. That can be paid for private pay, so out of your own pocket. If you are a veteran and you have aid and attendance benefits, that can pay for home care, long-term care insurance, and Medicaid will pay for home care. 
lots of companies have four hour minimums. And what that means is they don't want to send a caregiver to your home for anything less than four hours. Um, that's not all companies. Some will do shorter time periods, but if it's less than that, it's likely to be a higher hourly rate. Um, and some companies are it's as high as a six hour, hour hourly minimum for them to send a caregiver out. So you have to shop around a little bit to find out who's gonna meet your needs the best. Now, home health, these terms home care and home health kind of get used interchangeably, but they are actually different things. Um, whereas home care is the companionship care Home health is therapy. So it's physical therapy, occupational therapy, speech therapy. Um, it's ordered by your doctor and it's short term. So not forever, but a short term gonna give you some therapy to help you get stronger. Um, if you're doing it at home, you have to be homebound and homebound does not mean you're, you are absolutely, you cannot get out of the house. It means it's really difficult for you to get out and do your shopping and do different things. Um, when it's ordered by the doctor, it's paid for by Medicare Part A. Uh, so that is something that your Medicare should pay for in that short term while you're doing the therapy. All right, so those were all the things that would help us stay at home as long as possible. If your loved one decides that they actually want to make a move, to a community. Let's talk about the different kinds of communities and what they offer. So independent living is senior apartments, um, mostly senior apartments or little townhomes, cottages, that sort of thing. But you're independent still for the most part. It's like living in your own house, except now you're in a community with a lot of other seniors and you're getting some benefit from that um, in a couple of ways. Number one, it's maintenance free. And this is one of the things a lot of seniors like because they are tired of taking care of the house. They don't wanna mow the yard anymore. They don't wanna to have to fix the plumbing. So they're glad for somebody else to change the light bulbs and mow the yard and do all those things. Independent living is usually designed with those universal design techniques that I mentioned earlier. So it does have wide hallways. It does have wide doors. It's meant for seniors to live there with their walkers and their wheelchairs and anything else they may need. And so it has those elements that we're looking for to make life easy. They do generally offer meal plans, um, housekeeping, linen service, um, how much the meal plans are, like if you are getting that included with your rent or if you have to buy a meal plan separately, varies a little from community to community. So you have to shop around for that. But they generally all provide activities. No, nobody has to participate in the activities if they don't want to. They're going to encourage you to do that, but you don't have to. And then um, they provide transportation. So transportation to shopping, transportation to your doctor's visits, things like that. Again, you don't have to do that, but you can. Um, I've had several families where they really didn't want their senior to drive anymore, but mom or dad wasn't really ready to give up the car keys. So we moved to independent living and then the car kind of sat in the parking lot and mom and dad still had the car keys. So they felt good about that, but they almost never drove it again because they didn't have to. So there is some of that, I'm gonna maintain my independence, but I'm also gonna let somebody else drive if, if, I, ha if I can, if I don't have to drive, I won't. Uh, quick assistance if needed. So because they're in that kind of community, um, there are gonna be pull cords, emergency pull cords and some in the apartment. So if they fall in the bathroom or, um, the shower, they're gonna have a pool cord they can get to to ask get help. Um, a lot of communities also have the pendants that they ask residents to wear. Some residents want to wear them, some don't, but a, a push button kind of a, you know, I've fallen and I can't get up emergency um, necklace that they can wear again for help if they need it. And there's people right there in the building. It's not like being at home where nobody is close by. People are right there in the building um, that can get you help. Now they don't offer medical assistance themselves in independent living. If you need medical assistance, they're gonna call 911 for you, but they're not going to um, have medical personnel in the building. 
Um, there's also the benefit of having easy access to home care and independent living. So because you are in a building with lots of seniors and maybe a lot of you need little help with home care type things, um, some maybe some meal prep, maybe some clean, extra cleaning, maybe some companionship care. A lot of home care agencies, if they've got several clients in the building, will come and visit you for less than that four hour minimum because they, they can cover a lot of clients in a short, in a period of time while they're in the building. Um, or the independent living partners with their own particular home care agency to offer a discounted rate to the residents in the community. So it makes that access to home care a little easier. Independent living is private pay only. Uh, they don't accept long-term care insurance. There's no VA benefits for this. This is pay out of your, your pocket for the independent living. <laughs> Excuse me. All right, our next level of care, pardon me, is assisted living. So this is kind of the next step up in terms of care. Assisted living is the fastest growing type of care in the United States. Um, it tries to combine a home-like atmosphere with some actual medical help. So now we've got um, CNAs and med techs in the building and they are going to offer daily assistance with activities of daily, daily living like bathing, dressing, grooming, medication management, basically whatever you need, they will assist you with. You have your own plan of care um, with that community so that they know what you need them to help you with. Um, meal preparation, housekeeping, laundry services, social activities, um, and transportation, just like at independent living. Um, they often have exercise classes and therapy. Most independent livings um, have some of that too. Um, they partner with outside agencies for the therapy. But then the difference with assisted living is they're gonna have somebody who can help you on staff 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So um, a CNA, a med tech, there are people in the building and awake all the time if you need some kind of assistance, which is not necessarily true at independent living. So then the question for assisted living is what does it cost? Um, in our area, anywhere between 2000 and upwards higher of $4,000, depending um, on your room. Are you doing a private room? Are you doing a shared room? Um, and the size of the room. So square footage, things like that. They're generally month to month rentals. There's no long-term contract. You're not signing a lease for a year or anything like that. Most places make you um, ask for a 14 day notice if you need to move out. So you have a rent charge, which is your room and board basically. And then you have a care charge. The care charge is what you're actually getting help with in terms of care needs, that assistance with activities of daily living. Um, that can be, some communities bill that as part of their rent, so it's like included in their base price. Some communities do levels, so like a level one is someone who doesn't need very much care, a level five is someone who needs a lot of care, and so the price goes up as you move up through the levels. Some um, places do it a la carte, which means they look at what your specific needs are, they have a price for, the, for each of those specific things they're going to do for you, and then they price it a la carte, you know, just for those things that you're asking them to do. Who pays for assisted living? Um, one of the biggest misconceptions I see with folks is that they think Medicare pays for assisted living, and it does not. Um, Medicare pays for acute medical care. It does not pay for long-term care. So um, if, if anyone ever says, I'm gonna use Medicare to pay for my assisted living, no, that's not gonna work. Um, so it's private pay, um, long-term care insurance, but it is important to read the policy carefully because some of the original policies that were written for long-term care insurance were really written before assisted living even existed. So they will say something like, we pay for care in a community that has a 24 hour nurse or nursing staff, something like that. And assisted livings generally have a nurse between nine and five, 
Monday through Friday, um, and maybe you know on call on the weekends. And so, depending on how that long-term care policy is worded, you may or may not be able to get assisted living covered. Um, you may have to argue with the long-term care policy about it a little bit too. So it is it is something to read the policy for very carefully. Um, aid and attendance benefits um, can help pay for long-term care. Medicaid, um, in this case, when it pays for long-term care is called special assistance. There's Medicaid health care, and then there's Medicaid for long-term care, which is special assistance. They're not the same thing. Um, the terms kind of get used interchangeably, but they are separate things and qualifying for one does not necessarily mean you qualify for the other. Um, but for special assistance in an assisted living, your assets have to be below $2,000 and your income has to be below $1,247 a month in order to qualify. And we're gonna come back to Medicaid um, after we talk about memory care a little bit. So memory care is very similar to assisted living. Um, often assisted livings have a memory care wing or a memory care building on the same campus. Um, priced the same way in the sense that there is a rent charge and then there are care charges. Um, the difference is that memory care buildings are designed for people with dementia. So they are secure, which means all the doors are locked. Um, it's very common with folks with dementia to wander. They really like to walk and to want to go out the door, but then once they get out the door, they won't know how to get back in or they won't know where they are. So these buildings are secure, all the doors are alarmed so that if somebody goes out or tries to go out, the staff would know. Um, lower staff to resident ratio um, because memory care folks need a little more attention than just assisted living. And then generally the staff is specially trained on how to approach people with dementia because there are ways to do it that are helpful and then there are ways that are not so helpful. And so having staff who are familiar with dementia, how to deal with folks with them with dementia, how to approach what to say uh, is very useful. Same payer sources as assisted living, Medicaid will help. Um, the uh, qualifications for Medicaid are slightly different. Your assets still have to be below $2,000, but your income can be a little higher. Your income per month can be up to $1,580. All right, so um, I've mentioned Medicaid and paying for long-term care with Medicaid. I have a few cautions just to mention about it. Um, if you look up who is who can accept Medicaid, who's Medicaid certified, um, almost every community is Medicaid certified. And sometimes families think that means that everyone accepts Medicaid, and it does not. Um, communities can decide for themselves whether or not they want to accept Medicaid at any given point. So Medicaid certified is very different than accepting Medicaid patients. Um, so a lot of communities don't accept it. So um, using Medicaid will really limit your choices. There are often private pay wait times. And what that means is that a community can say, you have to be private pay with us for six months, one year, three years, whatever it is before we would allow you to roll over to Medicaid. And that's very important to take into consideration if you're doing any sort of long-term planning and thinking about how long someone's money is gonna last because you don't want to move somewhere that doesn't accept Medicaid or isn't gonna let them switch if they're gonna run out of money in a year or six months. And cause then you're gonna have to move again and it's not gonna, that's stressful for everybody. So you wanna be thinking about those things as you're looking at your communities. Um, who accepts Medicaid is constantly changing. It's kind of a moving target all the time. And it does limit your options um, for where you're gonna choose to go. All right, so now we're going to the next step up in terms of care, skilled nursing facilities. Skilled nursing facilities are really just one step out of the hospital. Um, they generally have two wings, um, two sections in them. One is for long-term care for folks who are there for the long haul. They live there, they've got some sort of scalable need that needs a 24 seven nurse pretty much all the time uh, or rehabilitation. 60% um, of stays in nursing homes are rehab. And so that's when you're going for 
recovery after an illness, after a fall, after a surgery, something like that. And you're going to skilled nursing to get therapy, to get stronger, to recover a little more before you go home. Um, Long-term care beds, um, Medicaid beds are in very high demand. There are many more people who want those than are available. Um, so you are often looking at a wait period um, if you're trying to go into a skilled nursing facility right from the beginning using Medicaid. Um, so one of the ways families get around that sometimes is by piecemealing together enough money to private pay for a month or two so they can get in the door and then moving to Medicaid after that to try to avoid some of the wait times. All right, so our payment sources here, um, Medicare after a hospitalization. Um, so we've always heard traditionally the three day hospital stay and then you go to skilled nursing and Medicare pays for the first 20 days. Um, that has traditionally been true. Um, right now with COVID, take all those rules and just kind of throw them out the window because um, they're not necessarily requiring that three-day hospital stay. Um, it depends on if you have traditional Medicare or if you've got a managed care plan, they may be doing things, handling it different. Um, COVID's kind of messed all those things that we knew that are written in stone, just throw them out because it's all a little different right now. But that has been um, traditional three-day hospital stay, and then you could go to skilled nursing, Medicare paid for the first 20 days, and then for day 21 through 100, you had some sort of copay um, varying based on your particular managed care plan. Um, if you're paying privately, it's going to be somewhere between seven and ten thousand uh, dollars per month. Long-term care insurance will generally pay for skilled nursing facilities. You may have an elimination period where you have to pay for a certain amount of time and then it starts, um, but it does generally cover that. Aid and attendance benefits, and then Medicaid in a skilled nursing facility, your assets have to be below $2,000, but there's no income cap. Um, so you that income, whatever you have per month is fine. Um, most of it's gonna go to the facility, but you can qualify for Medicaid there's no cap on the income like there is at um, assisted living or memory care. Okay, so just to refresh our memories, we started talking about home care, right? And how we were gonna stay at home and what we needed to do to get there. We've talked about independent living. We've talked about assisted living and memory care. We've talked about skilled nursing and how most people go there for short-term rehab, right? The last one I wanna talk about is this big oval here in the middle, the Continuing Care Retirement Community, or CCRC, as it's often called. So those are communities that have all the things that we've just talked about on one campus. They have independent living, assisted living, skilled nursing, memory care, all together. Um, this would be like in, in the Greensboro area, if you're familiar with our communities, this would be like a Friends Homes, a Whitestone, a Wellspring, Pennyburn, these kinds of places. Um, so they're beautiful campuses. Um, they're generally very high quality care. Um, they have very large entrance fees. It costs a lot of money to move in there. Um, entrance fees are $100,000 plus. I think about the cheapest one in our area is about $180,000. Um, and that's inexpensive compared to like Charlotte or Raleigh. Um, then if you pay that, most people sell their home and pay that to move in. If you pay that though, and then you decide to move out later, it's not the right fit, you don't like it, whatever it is, sometimes they're partially refundable. So that's something to really read the contract on to find out if I don't like this, am I going to get any of this big entrance fee back? How does that work? Um, then on top of your large entrance fee, you're going to have monthly fees. So like a rent charge on top of that. Um, they may have meal plans that you can opt in or out of. Um, but before you're going to move in, so people really like these communities because they're mostly nonprofits. And if you move in, they're going to take care of you. They don't kick people out. They're going to take care of you um, even if you run out of money. Um, so before you move in, they are going to financially vet you. <laughs> they are going to look at your finances and say, do you have enough money that we think you're going to be able to live here and not run out of money? And the other thing they're going to do is a nurse assessment. They're going to assess your health before you move in. 
And a lot of people will be living at home and thinking I'm independent because I'm still living at home even though they've got 24 seven home care in and they need lots of help with different things. And they'll be trying to move into friends' homes or into Penny Burn. And the nurse says, we'd really love to have you, but you're not independent anymore. And so that, you know, just because you still live at home doesn't mean you can live an independent living here. So they really want you to move in when you're truly independent so that you can take advantage of all the things they have to offer while you're in independent living. And then as your healthcare needs change, you can move from independent to assisted to skilled on their campus. Many of the communities in our area do have wait lists. They're all building right now. Like everybody's adding additions and apartments and things like that. So um, there's more, you know, availability coming, but they do uh, have a lot of wait lists right now. Okay, so to summarize, there is real value in learning about these things now, early on or as early as you can. And then there's real value in talking to your senior, talking to your loved one about what do you wanna do? Uh, because if you don't, then there'll be something that happens and you'll be going, well, you know, there's that pretty place I drive by on my way to work every day. I wonder if that's the place I can move to because you don't know what it is, you don't know what it does, and you don't actually know if it's what you need. So it helps you be proactive rather than reactive to the situation. And it can empower everybody to make good decisions and cope successfully as things change. Now, what are the questions to ask? Um, asking your parent, where do you wanna live? And seeing what they say. If they say they wanna stay at home, okay. What modifications do we need for you to be able to stay in this house? And what will they cost? Um, how much is home care in this area? And will we be able to afford that if you need it? Um, where will that money come from? Let's start thinking about that now. If they uh, say they wanna move, maybe they're, they're interested in a community, okay, where? Do you want that community to be near where you live now? Or do you want it to be near your adult child who lives in another state? Because that's a whole separate thing. So now we gotta, you know, who are, where you wanna go? We wanna stay here. We wanna move to be near our adult children or other family. Um, what do those communities cost? And can you afford it? How will you pay? So looking into, do we have a long-term care policy? Will it cover this? Um, will I qualify for VA aid and attendance benefits? Um, you know, all those things to start looking into. And what level of care will we need? Are we still looking at independent living? Are we kind of already to the assisted living phase? What are we uh, looking at? And then when you actually find a particular community that you're inter interested in, um, the things I encourage people to ask are, who are the residents? Every community has a personality um, and you need to know kind of what that is before you move in. So who are the residents? Are they all kind of from the area or from they, are they, from, they all, from all over? Are they all of one particular religious faith for the most part? Um, because you do see that some places that they tend to all be from some similar background. What are the meals? What meals are provided? Um, what kind of food is served? Because if you don't like the food and you're paying for it, that's not good. You, you want to have food that they're gonna be interested in eating. Um, what are the activities? What transportation is offered? What's included in my price versus what is gonna cost me extra? Um, what training and qualifications do the staff have? Um, always have a financial advisor look over the contract. And I always advise people to ask for references. Um, ask, can we talk to some of the residents? And can we talk to their adult children and see how they feel about it too? Uh, I always think that's a good indication, uh, you know, and not when the um, salesperson, whoever is standing right over your shoulder, <laughs> can we talk to them with you not here uh, to, to get a feel for if they like it, if they'd recommend that community. All right, the last thing I wanna show you is um, this Genworth cost of care survey this will um, calculate for you the cost of care 
in uh, wherever you live. I'm sorry, it's over here on my right hand screen. So that's why I'm going to look this way. Um, so I have put in Greensboro and you can put in monthly, daily, annual, whatever you want. This is 2020. So this tells you the monthly median cost of in-home care in Greensboro, um, assisted living or adult day in Greensboro, as well as nursing care in a semi-private room versus a private room. And what's really scary slash fun is to then say, well, I'll be 75 in 2050. So let's just go to 2050 and say, what's it gonna cost when I actually need uh, this kind of care? And then you can see those prices and decide that you better start saving a lot more to do that. But this is a really handy tool, especially if your loved ones don't live right here um, to be able to calculate the costs of care in another area. Okay, and now I am finished. All right, well, Corinne, we have, um, if, do we have some time for a few questions? Sure. Um, we have a question by Carol Ashina and um, Carol kind of shared her, her story of what's going on with her and her mother um, and looking for some advice. So uh, Carol writes that I'm in a crisis mode my 87-year-old mother went to the hospital on November 27th with COVID. She developed pneumonia, but recovered from both. She has dementia and has gotten much, uh, much more. Uh, she stopped eating and drinking. Uh, she can't walk anymore or help herself. She's extremely depressed and wants to die. She lived independently at Carolina Estates, but had to come in. Um, I want to bring her uh, back to Carolina Estates, but needs skilled nursing and someone who understands dementia. Um, I need to get her out of the hospital. Um, hospice care is a question. Um, she can't function on her own and she can't, uh, and she can't have a terrible temper. I need some help. So, uh, so Corinne, what, uh, what advice would you give to Carol? Well, I, I, we need to talk. <laughs> I mean, that, that is a really difficult situation, Carol. I, I know that is your, that is a struggle. I mean, especially with COVID and not being able to get in. I think, um, you know, without knowing all the details of it, but we need to talk about, yeah, if she can come out, where, where will she go? Um, hospice care very well may be appropriate. We can certainly uh, investigate that. Um, I think let's talk after because <laughs> I really think that is um, there's going to be a lot of moving pieces there in terms of, you know, should she go come out and go back to Carolina Estates with hospice? Should she come out and go to skilled nursing? Um, what, you know, where's her level of care? And if she gets out of the hospital with the depression, she may perk up quite a bit if she gets out of that situation. At least that would be the hope because, you know, I think it's real, everyone is struggling in communities right now. If they're not allowed to have any visitors, um, all of our seniors are struggling, not being able to see people, not being able to see loved ones. Uh, you know, it, it, I'm depressed some days too, because like I want to leave the house and actually see all of you folks in person. And so to be in a community or in a hospital where you can't see anybody and you're alone in a room, except for when the nurse comes in or the therapist comes in. Yeah, who who wants to be there? Nobody. So in some ways, I think her reaction to her situation is normal. Um, the question is, how do we get her out of that um, and into a better situation so that hopefully we can give her the will to live in this and not feeling so desperate and alone? Thank you. Um, question came in, uh, uh, how can we get copies of the notes, especially the Genworth tool? Um, so the Genworth, um, it's the, if you just Google what I had on the screen and I'm not, am I still sharing that? I am still sharing that. Um, the, if you just Google Genworth cost of care survey, it will come right up. Um, so there is no, um, 
no problem getting that. Um, that is the website right there at the top if you uh, see that link at the top as well. And if someone wants a copy of the presentation, I am glad to, to send that out. You can um, put it, put your email in the chat, bo chat box and I'm, I'm glad to give anybody a copy of the notes. And we do have your, uh, your email address in the chat box as well. Uh, so uh, Teresa, who is with, uh, who's, um, with us this evening, she is uh, with the Area Agency on Aging uh, of the Piedmont Triad Regional Council. Um, she shared with us that there are some grant-based in-home assistance services available across the region. Uh, it's not income-based, but for individuals over 60. So if you'd like some more information on um, some of these options, uh, you, know, you can contact Senior Resources of Guilford, or you can contact Teresa at the uh, Area Agency on Aging. And uh, she provided the phone number there in the chat box. Um, I think we have time for just a couple uh, questions, Corinne. So um, if, if our parents don't wanna talk about this difficult conversation, how would you go about, what would you do from there? So my first piece of advice is not to try to um, bombard them with questions all at once. Like I, the joke I usually make is don't like go to Thanksgiving dinner and be like, so what are we doing? Where do you want to live? Are you going to be able to pay for it? You know, that kind of um, interrogation. Um, unfortunately, that that joke doesn't really work since I think a lot of us won't even see our parents uh, over the holidays this year. But Whenever you do see them or you have an opportunity for a conversation, I think it is a conversation to be had over multiple visits, actually. So the, you know, the first conversation is, have you thought about this? You know, have you thought about, do you want to stay here? Would you be interested in a community? And see what they say. They may not have thought about it at all. So the first thing you want to do is open that door to say, well, let's talk about it. And then once they've been able to give it some thought based on what they say, which is probably going to be, I want to stay in this house as long as possible. Um, okay, you know, should we be thinking about how this house is going to work if, you know, as you, as things get not difficult, but different in the future, because a lot of those universal design things that are good for seniors, again, bring up your home value. So creating an open floor plan, widening the doorways, redoing the bathrooms, those are all things that increase home value. So it's, um, you know, if you can start thinking about them early and redoing the house before anybody actually needs any assistive devices or things like that, then you get to enjoy them a lot longer and you can spread out the cost of the renovations and things like that. So I think it's, again, you start having the conversation, you see where they're at, and then slowly over time, you keep having the conversation. You say, well, if that's what you want, let's think about this. Um, but if they feel like it's an attack, if they feel like you sat down at Thanksgiving dinner and you just bombarded them with questions, or that you're after them in some way, they will shut down <laughs> and say, you know, I don't want to talk about this and the conversation will be over. Okay, very good. We have one final question. <clears throat> uh, this is from Francis Hall. Um, uh, during COVID, um, are hospitals still having people come in even <laughs> for several days without actually admitting them? I know that this sometimes happens, um, that they're there just for observation then those three days don't apply for Medicare. What's the status of this now? And how do we know whether a loved one is actually admitted or whether they are just there under observation? So Francis, that's a great question. Um, you know, with COVID, I haven't heard anything about that recently. Um, at somebody else on the call may have more information than me, but I haven't had anybody say recently that there was the admitted versus observation kinds of um, difference. And again, they have, they're not necessarily adhering to that three day rule even with being a, moving from the hospital to the nursing home because of COVID. So that's not as big of, I don't think it would be as big of a problem right now as it has been um, in the past. Um, but if anybody else on the call has, has heard anything about that, 
I mean, all I hear about the hospitals right now is that they're totally overwhelmed. Yeah. Okay. So I don't think they want to hold anybody for three days if they don't have to get out. Yeah. Well, very good. Well, our time is up for this evening. Um, Dr. Allman, thank you so much for um, what great information and for um, uh, sharing those resources with yeah. us. Appreciate uh, your time this evening. We especially pre um, appreciate our sponsors for this evening, AARP and Age with Grace. Uh, we couldn't have done it without you, so thank you for your support. Our program next month um, is going to be on January 21st at seven o'clock. Uh, it's uh, driving and aging. So uh, we would love to have you with us again next month. Um, check out our website uh, to uh, get updates on uh, our monthly programs. So again, thank you for everyone for being here. We appreciate it. We hope that you found it helpful and uh, we'll look forward to seeing you next month.